my name's Amanda Third and I'm Professor in the Institute for Culture and Society and Co-Director of the Young and Resilient Research Centre at Western Sydney University. Um, and I've been researching children and digital media now for over a decade. Um, and I first got interested in these questions when I was awarded some funding actually to explore children's mobile usage and um, and that was a that was a project that was funded through a foundation um, and I did it with a couple of colleagues and um, it was kind of a tangential research interest for me but I was always interested in what children did with technology I think I grew up in a family that really loved technology and um, you know my father always encouraged the girls in the family to in particular to to experiment and explore technology and so um yeah I'd always had this interest in technology and an opportunity came up and I sort of fell into it by accident and then once I once I realized um you know the kind of the ways that uh, digital media were transforming children's lives I was hooked and so um yeah so I have I have spent the last 10 years looking at these issues. Yeah, I think I think I think feminist theory has been really critical to the ways that I think about the child as a subject. So really sort of thinking through that social constructivist lens um, to think about the ways that we interpolate children and, and demand particular performances from them. Um, but at the same time, you know, sort of thinking through the ways that children um, develop a sense of agency and push back against adult ways of thinking and, and enact their own forms of resistance. I think there are, um, yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've really sort of drawn heavily on, on a range of feminist theorists there um, to sort of develop that thinking. I think, you know, um, Judith Butler, for example, is, is, it was really foundational to some of the work that I did originally, um, you know, just thinking through the questions of subjectivity and, and so on. So, yeah, I'd say, um, I'd say that sort of feminist theory has had a really strong influence. Um, but of course, you know, when you study digital media, um, it's such a it's such a, um, a, a rich subject area that that no one particular lens really sort of gives you all the tools that you might need to make sense of it. And so I think I've learnt in a very cultural studies kind of way to poach from different disciplines. So, you know, I could also easily cite someone like Walter Benjamin and his work around sort of the work of art in the age of technological reproducibility is a really key reference point for me in terms of thinking about the role of digital media in contemporary culture and see and understanding uh, I guess the evolution of those technologies um, simultaneously is a kind of a rupture of history, but also um, as characterized by deep continuities. I think in general, I have a tendency to try and situate things in their historical context. That's really, really important to me. Um, I think also, um, you know, I'm, I'm sensitized to questions about cultural specificity. I'm interested in exploring how different practices evolve in different contexts and settings and the rationale and logics that drive those. Um, I'm also really interested in, in you know, um, sort of thinking through ideas around the way that the future and temporality in general kind of impacts on, on the things we believe and the ways we enact in relation to children. Um, and, you know, and, and I think the future obviously is a really when you're talking about children, inevitably you have to grapple in some sense with, with the idea of the future. So I've also been interested in theories that sort of think about temporal logics of digital media. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, in, in short, I'm, I'm drawing on a very wide range of, of different theoretical inspirations. I think, I think what's really fascinating to me is that um, when I first sort of began to dip into the field of children and digital media use, there was a lot of um, very, what we might call top down or adult centric theory at play, ideas about childhood and technology and, you know, all things digital that really um, seem to be driven primarily by 
um, adult concerns and fears. And I think what I've seen over the last decade is actually that um, as technology itself has become more participatory, so too the, the tools and concepts that we use to make sense of children's digital media practices have kind of shifted in, in parallel with that. And so we've begun to see, um, you know, all sorts of participatory methods um, come to the fore in, in work with children around their digital media practices. One, one further point that I would make is that, um, is that often we, we don't, we expect of researchers that they can perform expert, right? They can perform as the expert, I should say. Um, and we don't often actually acknowledge that being a researcher involves a lot of doubt and a lot of uncertainty, a lot of grappling and searching for answers um, that aren't necessarily always forthcoming. And, so, and I think we need to acknowledge that actually theorizing in this space needs to be it needs to be brave and bold it needs to be experimental it needs to grapple with really difficult subjects um, and it also needs to grapple with a whole range of political sensitivities and um, and 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 um, you know and injustices in a sense right I think there are theories that I use to help me make sense of the uncertainty that I feel myself. And again, this, this comes from a sort of a, a broad range of sources. Um, I think, you know, certainly complexity theory has featured very strongly in my thinking to date in the sense that um, I think one of the things that I've been trying to think through is how can research with children about their digital media practices um, move with with the pace of technology, but also children's own growth, um, and and also indeed in in relation to the pace of change at play in in our cultures, you know, internationally. So I think um, I've really been trying to sort of think with complexity theory there to sort of work out how we move with the times. And um, I think another key inspiration for me recently has been. Um, the work around resilience thinking and and sort of you know and I think that's again it's it's I guess you could configure it as a version of complexity theory but actually what it's trying to do is really think about what does it mean to be resilient and it's it's concerned not just with um, individual resilience but actually community and or collective resilience um, which I you know seems to me to be a major challenge lying ahead for all of us. Um, a challenge, I should say, that I see technology as potentially playing a really important role in, right? I think technology, if harnessed well, and if we give our children the space to explore and experiment with technology in really interesting ways, that actually maybe it becomes part of a solution to some of the major challenges that are confronting us, whether they be climate change right down to, you know, um, unaffordable housing or uh, mental ill health or, you know, uh, a pandemic, for example, right? So, um, so yeah, I, you know, I think, I think there's a, there's a real need to be thinking creatively about, about, about complexity and to be channeling that into, into our work, because we, we do, we are grappling with a complex world and children, if we're, if we're thinking about children, their digital media practices, well, of course, they are, they are growing up in a world that is, is ever more complex. And so, yeah, so we need some robust ways of theorizing complexity, I think. Um, um, but also I'm kind of, I'm also interested in, you know, theorizing method, I guess. And um, I guess I take some inspiration from, you know, methods like participatory action research, um, um and and so on and i'm i'm sort of really interested in thinking about how we um uh how we how we yeah how we perform togetherness and how we you know, and indeed how we perform um our differences in that togetherness right but also how we push that how we push our thinking forwards in ways that uh open up new creative possibilities for dealing with challenges Often what we what we are seeing is a sort of a clash between 
normative adult framings of the world and then children's own framings of the world. And, and in a way, you could read those as two different theorizations of, of the world, right? Um, I think I think this really this comes to the fore when children talk about safety online. Um, I think you know for 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 adults that the concerns are, you know, the ones that come out of a lot of research, um, you know, very good research for that matter. You know, adults have concerns around things like. Uh, their children being exposed to inappropriate content or um, meeting and talking with strangers and potentially meeting them offline. Um, you know, sort of, I guess, um, I mean, these are real concerns and, and, and they're things that have motivated a lot of online safety education and really important. But when you talk to kids, you know, yeah, the majority, the majority of children have quite different concerns on some levels. Um, they, they talk more about very everyday risks, like social risks, basically. You know, they talk about teen drama or they talk about, you know, something their friend said that upset them or an image they received that they didn't want to see or, you know, but it's, it's, it's much more about their, their relationships to, to their, you know, the people they know in offline settings. Um, and yeah, and, and, you know, and I mean, the other, so, so you get this kind of clash, if you like, between the perceptions of, of what risks might be and, and where the harms might stem from. Um, and I think this, you know, this raises a whole series of interesting questions about how we then direct online safety education, how we connect um, education that addresses those much more serious concerns that adults often have with children's very, um, you know, deeply personal lived experience. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, the other, the other, the other, or another good example is um, the difference that children make, or, well, you know, adults often distinguish between the online and the offline. And so we talk about, you know, online safety and safety in the street as two different things. But for kids, of course, that distinction doesn't always hold. Um, and so that, you know, they tend to think about digital media as just one more space in which they carry out their everyday lives and socialize with others and so on. Uh, it's another, just another space of socio-technical interaction for them. Um, and, and yeah, and so, and what that means is that they think they, they often don't have a window on, on some of the things that adults think they should have a window on. Um, and so I think some of these clashes really, you know, um, they, I think they throw into stark contrast um, or, the, or they, they, they open up um, new possibilities, like things that we have to think differently about, we have to account for, and we have to respond to. I think there are a bunch of um, concepts that we deploy quite routinely and in a quite offhand way often um, that we really need to stop and think carefully about. And one of, one of those for me is the, is the prefix, the digital. Um, I think, you know, for, for children, um, it often it doesn't make sense to talk about digital citizenship as something separate from citizenship. It doesn't, talk, it doesn't always make sense to talk about online safety as something distinct from other forms of safety for children. Um, so I, I really think we begin, we need to begin to um, scrutinize the, the, the ways that we throw that word digital into the conversation. Um, and indeed, I've begun to think that we need to, when we use it, when we want to say digital citizenship, that the very least we should do is put it in brackets to acknowledge that it's like, you know, it is that digital citizenship is, is connected to broader forms of citizenship or that digital resilience is in fact one inflection or, or a particular variety of resilience more broadly. So I think, I think the digital is one that we have to really look closely at. Um, I, think, I think, as I was saying earlier, I think we need to really um, be careful what we what we what we mean when we say the word the child. I think we project a lot of adult anxieties as well as hopes and 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 aspirations onto the onto the figure of the child. And I think, you know, um, yeah, we we need desperately to keep those in check um, because often we enforce quite impossible standards for children. They have to live up to these um, 
to this this category, if you like, um, in ways that that don't reflect <laughs> their lives and are actually really impossible. So um, I think definitely sort of scrutinising the ways that we use the word child. Um, uh, and I, yeah, and I think, I think just generally, there's a very mm, strong tendency in some of, some of the work around children in digital media that, that thinks about the child simultaneously as at risk, but also as risk. So the child is vulnerable, unable to defend themselves, um, needs adult guidance, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But on the other hand, the child is a site of contagion, um, a site of perhaps unwitting, but perhaps quite wishing, um, subversion, uh, you know, and, and, and a, site of, a site of risk. So, and I think that's, this is one of the ways that we put children in an impossible position, position is, is we, we, we want them to be both at risk and perform as risk if that makes sense and that's 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 very tricky so I think we need to really begin to think through that binarization if you like much more carefully and to try to find more constructive um, ways of talking about the child in in relation to digital media I'm very deeply concerned to bring the theoretical and, and what we might loosely call the empirical together in my work. I think um, there's certainly room for um, very you know, empirical and, and what we might think of as pure and applied, um, you know, mobilizing data in applied settings. There's also space for what we might consider pure theorizing, if you like. But to me, the, the kind of, um, I find my motivation at the intersections between those two things. So really for me, the question is thinking about how to activate particular theories in context, um, how, to, how to activate them for real world um, scenarios and to, and to address real world challenges. Um, and at the same time, I'm also always simultaneously trying to look for ways for the data itself to drive my theorizing. Um, so it's, I think it's not a straight, you know, theory doesn't, theory doesn't emerge in my work at least, or in my experience um, in a very straightforward way. There's a, there's a constant interplay between theory and, and other sources of inspiration and, and grounding, if you like. I'm of the mind that if you can introduce children themselves to theory, in a way that's, you know, in a way that makes sense to them, but gives them something to grapple with. But actually, this is often a really nice thing to do in a participatory activity um, that's designed to generate data is actually have children themselves grapple with theory. So, um, so you know, I think we we try and do that in all kinds of ways. We try to um, we try to sort of get them to think through power dynamics on the internet or um, indeed power dynamics, the power dynamics that shape their, um, the rules and, and regulations that uh, their parents and, and others put around their digital practices. So we, you know, we try and sort of activate theory, like, you know, in that case, theories of power in, in a workshop setting with children um, and to have them, and to have them grapple with it and to, and to speak back to it, so to speak. Right through through the process, I think I'm activating theory, but in different kinds of ways. I think also when I communicate the results of research, I'm I'm bouncing up what we found in the field with the theoretical concepts and 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 the analysis that has come before. Um, I think also, you know, what we don't often do is creates enough spaces for policymakers and. Um, uh, you know, NGOs, um, you know, all of the different sort of um, adult institutions and organisations that impact children's lives to grapple with theory themselves. We, we think as researchers often that we have to boil it down and, um, and package it really nicely when actually, you know, often we're dealing with a lot of smart people and, and you, you, know, you, can, you can throw a theory at them and, and have them consider it and critique it and um you know I found often um 
I found often that, um, you know, we can have quite deep theoretical conversations um, that then influence the way people think about making a policy or, or developing a program. And I think that's really, really important. We have to, we have to not only activate theory in the research work itself, but also in the communication of the research, in the activation of that research beyond the academy. Um, I think I think that's really critical. And indeed, um, yeah, I think I think there's lots of wonderful inspiration in theory. The the you know one of my favourites at the moment is uh, Hannah Arendt's theorisation of the child and in relation to natality and. You know, she sort of she has this lovely way of explaining that it's our job as adults to introduce children who are born new into this old world to introduce them incrementally to this old world over time, without ruining the opportunity that their newness offers to the old world. And I think this is just a really lovely way of thinking about children. Um, and it comes straight from you know, a theoretical essay, but people get it, and um, and it and it I think can inspire us inspire us into action. So I think I think theory is so important. Theory theory really really matters. Um, to to say that we can just just do applied work without theorizing is is a fallacy. Theory is critical. So I think that we're yet to imagine the full range of possibilities of digital media for enhancing children's lives. I think we're really yet to grapple with the opportunities that technology brings. Um, so I see a real gap, a real need for us to think and theorise in that direction. How, how, because I think if we don't theorise in that direction, we can easily be paralysed by fear um, and, and we can, we can, make mistakes and miss opportunities and, and so on. So I do really think there's space for thinking creatively about how we really maximise uh, technology for the future. And to that end, I think there's, there's obviously no simple way to think through what theories we might need into the future. But I think if we are thinking about theories for the future, it makes sense for adults to work with children and to develop those theories together. Um, so theory is really critical to um, the field of children and digital media. And, but I think there are often orthodoxies at play that mean that we constrain the ways we think about theory. I'd love to see us be much more creative and inventive in our theorizing. And in particular, I'd love to see us think about the opportunities that digital media presents for a complex world, grappling with crises of all different kinds. And I'd love to see us think about theorizing from a genuinely child-centered place about what the future holds. Mm -hmm.